Welcome everyone to another Smash Brothers commentary. Man, it has been too long. I am so, so sorry. I just haven't felt up to snuff to do commentaries. Why, well, I, I guess I just haven't been sure of myself. I know it's a ridiculous excuse, but that's just how I've been feeling. So, I'm sorry for my long absence, and I'll try to do my best to continue. If you show me lots of support for this commentary, I will definitely keep on continuing my commentaries. And they'll be pretty outspoken, and they might get to controversial topics, which you might not want to listen to, but if you can, pay, pay attention, listen in, and get your voice heard. Because I'll try to tell things from the most factual and probably most historical point of view on what I may go over, whether it's current events, history, or what have you. Alright, now to get to the real commentary topic for today, I even wrote a whole paper for this. I'm going to continue on the President's Commentary series. And now, to finally move on to the next President, after William Henry Harrison, who died in just a few... in a few... in about a month or so after, after taking the Presidency, I am going to go on to the next person, John Tyler. John Tyler was president from 1841 to 1845. With William Henry Harrison's death, it left everyone in shock. Even in Washington, where the late president's ill condition was more widely known, no one thought it would end in his death, and so soon. When at this time there was no real solution to this situation, most people agreed that as vice president, John Tyler should take over the president's responsibilities, but few thought he would assume the presidency himself. When the two were running for office, the slogan was, Old Tippy Canoe and Tyler Two. Very catchy. Now with Tippy Canoe's death, only Tyler Two was left. The more obvious man to take over would have been Henry Clay, who Harrison had narrowly defeated in his bid for the Whig Party, which was a political group in favor of modernization and economic protectionism. Abruptly, the situation was taken out of Henry Clay's hands. Chad and Tyler had other ideas and took the position of president without skipping a beat. His actions left Washington as stunned as Harrison's death did. Before they knew it, Tyler was delivering his inaugural address. The two houses, the House and Senate, could not do anything to stop him. The idea where the vice president inherits the presidency after a president quits or dies is actually a very recent one. It became law only with the ratification of the 25th Amendment in 1967. This was to set a precedent of future vice president successors to come, but at the time, Tyler's actions were pretty outrageous. Due to his actions, John Tyler was dubbed his accidency by his enemies, which, of course, Tyler had many. Henry Clay never forgave him for his audacity, and when the president used the veto to frustrate the Whig Party's attempts to set up a national bank as a way of preventing stock market panics, like the one that rocked the country in 1837, Clay led moves to have him expelled from the Whig Party. Even though he was expelled from the party, Tyler went on with little trouble at all. But his use of the, v of the veto raised eyebrows as his presidency went on and was used more and more often. It wasn't any better for him the fact that he was never elected president. Eventually, ex-president John Quincy Adams called for Tyler's impeachment. In the event, he was, somehow, he was somehow able to write out the storm. He pointed out that the presidential veto was explicitly provided for in the Constitution. If as the president he had the power, why not use it? Good point, good point. Whether you hate him for it, it is part of his powers. He didn't he didn't break any laws and he didn't overstep his boundaries. So grounds for impeachment was definitely outrageous for them to do. His enemies also tried but failed worse when they charged Tyler with acting improperly and paying private individuals to investigate suspected large-scale fraud at the New York Custom House, which was a primary port for imported goods which brought in a lot of revenue. It goes by a different name today though. But wasn't he supposed to uphold the law as his presidential obligation? Good point, though. He did what he could. He paid some private individuals. So, he did what he could, and he didn't overstep any boundaries. 
debate what you can against it or not, whether it was the right idea or not. You know, he did what he could. Despite the differences between Tyler and his party, there was some positive legislation. The log cabin bill that they, were, that they had passed enabled a settler to claim 160 acres of land before it was offered publicly for sale and later pay $1.25 an acre for it. Don't know if this is adjusted for inflation or not. He also signed a tariff bill protecting northern manufacturers. Webster the Webster-Ashburton Treaty excuse me, ended a Canadian boundary dispute. And in 1845, Texas was officially annexed into the United States. Tyler, being the state's writer he was, strengthened the presidency. But it also increased sectional cleavage that led toward the Civil War. So his so what he had did unknowingly pushed the South further and further into their want to secede from the Union. John Tyler wasn't very respectful or proper with the aftermath of William Harrison's death. Assuming presidency without approval when it wasn't legal is a move similar to monarchy, which the U.S. was founded against such a principle. Is this for the better, though? We may not have had some of the precedents we did if it weren't for Tyler's actions. For better or for worse, because there were some that were debatedly good, but some that were debatedly bad. Now, my personal verdict for Taylor as president? Based off of the information given, I would say he was an okay president. He didn't do too badly. My only nitpick was that he nitpicks were that although he was he was pretty insensitive with usurping the presidency without hesitation and w against the law and the constitution at the time his use of the veto is debatable he definitely didn't follow along his own party's agenda but that doesn't give him any bad points sucking up to your party and following along with your party can lead to some awful consequences as we see in modern day america but he was a part of what led to the division of the United States, so that that could count as some bad points against him. Well, that's all I have to say about President Taylor. He, was a, he left his mark on the U.S. and the presidency and the office. So, what do you think? Anything I omitted that might have been important? Anything that you want to say and might want to say about John Tyler and his presidency? Leave it in the comments, I'm interested to know what you think. But that's all I have to say on President John Tyler. Join me next time when I go over the next president, James K. Polk. Now, thank you for joining me for this commentary. Sorry if I'm a little bit stuttery, but it has been a while since I've done a commentary. And I did write this down ahead of time. So I didn't wouldn't stutter as much and would remember all the important details. I did it pretty good, didn't I? Tell me how I did. Okay, with that said, this is this is Wi-Fi Brawler, aka Darth Malevolence, signing out. Thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of the video.
good on you, son. Little man. <laughs>